Hamish, mathematical biologist and game designer. Um, and the title of my talk is Recent Developments in Puzzle Design and Educational Software and a Model for Convergence. How do I get rid of this problem? Yeah. The left one, thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, and today I'm going to, uh, three sections of my talk. Number one, I'm going to look at expressive level design in video games. Um, then I'm going, in section two, I'm going to look at Brett Victor's uh, new sort of model for educational software, um, which you can kind of call an interactive essay. Um, and because I find Brett Victor's work very, very interesting, I think it's a really great model for communicating certain things. Um, and I also think that video games expressive level design is a great way of communicating certain things. I've done some projects that try to put these two things together. Um, and ideally get the best of both worlds. Okay, so first, video games, um, and I'm going to try and... Uh, the point of this section is that you can see some things that uh, video games might be able to contribute to educational software. Okay, and we're first going to start with a very... with a quite old, quite cliched video game. Um, There's a game called Catacomb Abyss, which is um, a game about you're a little wizard, you're walking around some sort of uh, old abandoned ruins and you can shoot fireballs from your hands. So, standard video game stuff. Um, there's something quite interesting that happens in the first level of the game. Uh, like I say, it's a game, you can shoot fireballs from your hand and you use them to shoot. The expectation is that uh, you'll shoot zombies, like this one on the front of the game box here. Um, but something else that can happen is, in the game is that you can destroy walls, right? Um, you can shoot a fireball at some walls, not all walls, and some of them, they will crumble apart and you'll be able to walk through the rest of the maze or something. You'll just be able to discover some secret. And that's quite an important thing to know about when you're playing the game. Uh, however, a person starting out on this game does not know that uh, you can destroy walls with your fireballs. You know, they start up the game, they're in this area, and they look around, and they try pressing buttons, and they see that they can throw fireballs, but they don't necessarily see, oh, I can, I, I, they don't necessarily guess that, oh, I can destroy some walls with my fireballs. Um, they might read the instruction manual, but then a lot of people don't read the instruction manual, which is fair enough, because reading instruction manuals is very, very boring. Um, okay, so, the game designers sort of have a problem here. They, they have an interesting element of their game, which is that you can destroy walls with fireballs, but not everybody knows it, not everybody can guess it. And something that they could do here, something that most game designers would do, would be to put up a great big sign at the beginning of the game saying, you can shoot fireballs at certain walls and there, there'll be treasure behind them or whatever. They could describe it to you, uh, they could describe it to the player in the same way that I've just described it to you. But again, that would be very, very boring. That would be a great big sign at the beginning of the game. And you're saying, I played, I bought this video game and I want to be playing with it. Um, I don't want to be just being told what to do. Um, so they thought of a better method. Uh, you go, you start up the game and you look around. You go into a certain corner, okay? This particular corner. Um, and a zombie appears. This zombie. And you're like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? Um, you start firing. And this is the beginning of the game, so you're not very good at shooting, you start firing mostly randomly. And note that this area is very, very enclosed. Mostly in a game when you're shooting at people, they're not, they're not so close to you, and um, the walls are a little bit further away and so on. So you're firing randomly, you're in this like little cubby hole, so, I mean, here's the map of the, the, map of the first level of the game. Um, you're in that little cubby hole up there. So, um, What's likely to happen is you're shooting around and you hit the zombie, and so you kill the zombie, hooray. Um, but because you've been firing randomly, you're also quite likely to accidentally hit one of the walls. And it just so happens that the walls in this little area of this first level, a lot of them are destructible. Okay? So the player will accidentally discover, that it's very probable that the player will accidentally discover that they can break down walls. Um, but you know, in, in some sense it's not an accident. The designers very consciously thought, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll engineer a scenario in which the player accidentally discovers one of their abilities, and won't that be wonderful? Um, because it's very memorable, you're like, 
oh, I've made this uh, accidental discovery. Um, that's so much more interesting than just being told what to do. Um, it's also a sort of very fast way of learning things, very natural feeling way of doing things. Um, and it's active, of course. You're not just sitting there being, yeah, you're not just sitting there listening to someone. So it's fun, right? Something that's striking and it's active um, and you see something new and specific happen. Okay, that is sort of what fun is. And what I'm trying to say with this slide is um, we've had 30 years of the games industry now and game designers have done lots and lots of, quite, quite a lot of things. Obviously, a lot of video games are pretty silly, but. Um, Every once in a while, a video game developer will come out with a new way of showing people things in a sort of virtual environment that I really, really think that educational software should seriously be taking note of. Um, so much more fun than just being told what to do. Okay. Uh, they, they're, they're entertainers, right? They're not allowed to be boring. Um, and, but the next thing I want to show you, uh, I'd like to indicate that um, video games have come a long way in that time. I mean, this first game I showed, I showed you, Wizards Killing Zombies, who cares, right? Um, but here's a video game, came out a little while ago that I think is much more interesting. Oh dear, I may have to watch the stupid advert. I hate the internet. Welcome to the Aperture Science Enrichment Center. Let's look at some of the challenges you'll face as a test participant. You may be required to perform simple tasks, such as locating an exit. These simple tasks may be supplemented with insurmountable obstacles. Thanks to the Aperture Science handheld portal device, the impossible is easy. Let's look at a real-world example. Certain objects may be vital to your success. If at first you don't succeed, you fail, and the test will be terminated. When stuck, remember our motto, there's a hole in the sky through which things can fly. We believe that a highly motivated test subject can carry out rather co Oh. No, I don't know what happened now. Okay, let's go back to the game. Alright, that's the game Portal, which I think is basically the best game of all time. Came out about seven years ago. Um, you generally, you're trying to get to the exit. You can see this doorway here. You know, that little robot there will try to stop you from reaching it. And it's usually a lot more complicated, is the thing. Um, those are introductory levels that are just trying to indicate the basic you know, things. So why do I think that Portal is um, the best game of all time? Um, it's, not, it's not just things that you can see in that trailer, it's something that I have to tell you. Um, so when I showed you that example from Catacomb Abyss, where you accidentally find out the thing, um, in Catacomb Abyss, you were discovering a programmed behavior. So the programmers of Catacomb Abyss, they said, it, it, there's some line of code in the game that says, fireball destroys you know, wall. I mean, it's going to be more complicated than that. But uh, in Portal, you, in addition to learning the fundamental rules of the game, you also learn emergent things. Probably a lot of you know what I mean by the term emergent, but just to clarify, um, in mathematics we have we have like the rules of the game, the axioms like a plus b equals b plus a, right? or a plus brackets b times b plus c, bra open close brackets equals a b plus a c. But those are axioms. But then the whole point about mathematics is you take these fundamental well. I don't want to say the whole point of mathematics, but generally what you do in mathematics is you take these little rules and you combine them together in enormous great big strings of things and then you get something surprising, right? You get a theorem that you can prove. And in Portal, um, I'm going to give you an example.
example of something where it does that. And its teaching style is even better. I mean, in Catacomb Abyss, uh, we, we saw something that I think is pretty cool. Learning through accident, right? Engineered accidents that can teach you things. Um, in Portal, there's uh, something much better I'm just about to show you. But there's something philosophically interesting about Portal. Um, you need to bear in mind. It's a revolution for game developers, I think. Because it said, um, what, what, is, what is a fun puzzle? What's make, what makes a, fun, a puzzle fun or an engagement with a game fun? And usually okay. game developers would say, oh, well, it's a combination of sort of tactile you know, sound effects and um, you know, things happening fast and a little bit of complexity. And with puzzles, they want things to be hard, right? Usually a person say, would say, a puzzle isn't fun unless it is hard. And when, it's, when you manage to do it, you get some satisfaction. Um, because you say, oh, I managed to beat this hard thing. But Portal is not about being hard. Portal is actually about being as easy as possible. It wants to be as easy as possible while expressing interesting things to you. And here's the example I'm going to give you of quite an interesting thing that Portal expresses to you. Um, so in Portal, there's gravity, right? If something goes up in the air, there's a force that pulls it downwards. Um, whether it's a box or whether it's a person, or whatever else, there is gravity. Um, Portal, as you also saw, it's got this interesting thing. The whole point of the game is you've got like two doorways and you can put them on different walls and you go through one and you come out the other. That's the point of Portal. So it's got gravity and it's got portals. And so you put those two things together and you, uh, those are programmed behaviors of the game. But you put those two things together and you get something that isn't really a programmed behavior. Um, if you play the game, you will understand what I'm about to say a little bit better, but the, there's, a, there's a tactic in the game, which is that you, if I'm sitting here and I want to get to here, I might be like, oh gosh, well I can't jump that far, what am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is combine gravity and, and portals, and I'm going to put a portal on the floor after this great big drop that might kill me. But if I put a portal here and here, um, I, go, I have my drop and I build up some momentum and I'm able to transfer, I'm able to appear in a new place with some momentum. Um, this is pretty cool, it's a clever tool, and the designers of the game, they put it in the game, and they found out that it was a really hard puzzle. Um, yeah, very hard puzzle. Very few people would get it, and, when they, and if they did get it, it might be by luck or something, they wouldn't really understand what had happened. And so the designers of the game put in a lot of infrastructure to really clarify what's going on with this move. And there's a whole series of puzzles that I put little pictures here. I mean, I don't expect you to be able to look at um, these in detail, but you know, there's uh, seven puzzles here, and they all build up this move that you're learning. Um, and to look briefly at the first one and the last one, for some reason I have to click twice in order to get it to move on. Um, the, the, on the right, we've got the last puzzle, which involves a really sort of complicated fling. Uh, it's called the fling. This phenomenon is called the fling. In, the in, the, in this one, this isn't even a puzzle. It's nothing. You walk into this room, and, and there's the exit. All you have to do in order to get to, through this room is to just put a, put a portal on the wall, and then walk through it. And then you just plop onto here. Okay? Very simple doesn't feel like a puzzle, but it introduces a structure that is built upon by future puzzles. Okay? This is a really revolutionary thing. But someone saying, oh, this is a game, every single part has to be like challenging to you, it has to be fun, it has to be a puzzle. But no, here the designers are saying, we're going to make it nice and easy for people. We're going to express things to them by starting out with this sort of trivial task, but it doesn't take too long. And in the long term, it'll really help out a lot of people in understanding it. And there's a whole more, uh, I'm going to um, skip the rest of it, all those previous puzzles, um, there's something interesting to be said about them, about what they, what they introduce into what they, you already know. Um, and there's an article about that you can read if you like, but uh, yeah, that's the end. Um, so what I want to say is educational games are a thing that actually makes sense. In the past, educational games in my opinion, have been really, really awful, almost without exception. All they really do is they have a bit of fun game to play, 
and then you go and do some learning task, right? So there's a game called Math Blaster, and it's just a game about fighting aliens, but then sometimes the aliens stop and they say, what's five times nine? And I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's, a, it's, not, just, it's not just a horrible waste of time, really stupid, it's also a horrendous waste of potential. Because the things that I've just been talking to you about, it should be clear that this is stuff that can be used for education really well. Educational games should be the most natural thing in the universe. But because the industry is filled with hacks, sorry, I shouldn't be too incendiary. <coughs> whatever, whatever, okay. Um, it's obvious that there's a lot of potential. Games also test you on certain things, right? A puzzle is something that you can't. Um, get through, you're not allowed to progress until you've worked something out. That's what you do in school, it's also what you do in a video game. Um, and by the way, there's also, there, there is one vein of, get, of um, educational games that's got a lot of popularity at the moment and I want to disassociate myself from it. There's something called gamification, which is when you uh, all you do is, you have, it's like ordinary education, but with more rewards. And they're like, ooh, we've taken a method from video games where they reward you loads of stuff with like lots of particle effects and sound effects and treasure and stuff. Um, but gamification is, I, in my opinion, not such a good thing. Um, I want to disassociate myself from that. How much time do I have? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, skip that one. Okay, if you're interested in video games, I encourage you to look up these people. I'm going to go and return to this slide at the end. They're all very cool. I could talk about them for ages, but obviously I won't. Um, so there's a, there's a guy called Brett Victor, who some of you might have encountered before because he's uh, very into Papert. Um, and Brett Victor has made something called an in, what I would call an interactive essay. He doesn't use the word interactive essay. Um, but yeah. Uh, so Brett Victor took an idea from Alan Kay, it seems, um, which was, you can express something, it's kind of what I've just been saying, you can use interactivity to express something, like a mathematical model, right? This is something that you're all familiar with. Um, and so what Brett Victor did was he made a sort of translation of this scientific paper on network theory. Um, so this is, it was a paper on the small worlds phenomenon, which is something like, um, I am probably connected with everybody in this room by sort of like four people, as in like, I have a friend who has a friend who knows someone, who met someone, who met you at some point in the past, which is like an interesting mathematical thing, and there was this good paper on it. Um, and what Victor did was that he, so on the left, I've got the, the original paper, and they've got one little diagram here, and Brett Victor was like, do you know what, this paper sucks, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty well written, but uh, as well written as you could expect, but like it's got lots of, in this little paragraph there's lots of algebra and you've got to sort of read it and like form a, met, form a model in your head and it's like, why should you have to do that? Why shouldn't the paper just show you as much as possible? So it's got some visualisation, um, so, so he's, he's got his translation and this is on the right. He's got a bunch of pictures, um, which illustrates it a bit better, but he's also got um, uh, I've got it in a separate tab, but I don't think I'll open it. You've got sliders here, you can sort of see in the middle of the page, you've got sliders and you can click on them and move them from side to side. Do you know what? I'm just going just gonna to show it to you. Here it actually is. And um, yeah, I can do something like this. Right? You know, that, that's the action of rewiring. Um, and he has this, it's very direct, it's a very natural method of communication. Um, oh, I've moved the thing, who cares? Moving on. Uh, yeah, it's very natural, it's very direct. He's just sort of saying, why don't scientists use little interactive things in the same way that they do pictures? It's the most natural thing in the world to illustrate a little mathematical model. Why not? Um, it might be hard in a web environment, but yeah, whatever. It's something that we can work on. Um, and it just so happens, uh, Brett Victor is slightly influenced by game developers. He's a big fan of Portal and Brave and a couple of other things. Um, game developers also seem to be the only people who have picked him up so far. So he made this interactive essay, 
and then a bunch of other game developers, uh, then a bunch of game developers did. Um, Amit Patel, yes, these names, Chad, I actually don't know how to pronounce that name, so I won't try. Um, they, they, they created some pretty really nice things. Um, but okay, uh, Brett Victor's thing is not very much like a game in another sense, which is that uh, games have challenges, and Brett Victor's little slidey demo things, there's no challenge there, which is fine, of course. It still illustrates an idea, but Something that's nice about video games is, like I said earlier, you can test people with a video game. You can say, I've got an interactive thing here, and I'm not going to let you progress, and, to, and I want you to do a specific thing with it. I want you to get from this place to the exit of the room in Portal, right? Or I want you to kill a bunch of zombies. Um, yeah. So there's no goal, and so there's less specificity, by which I mean that Brett Victor doesn't really know, so if there was some phenomenon inside of the interactive demo that Brett Victor made, he wouldn't really have any way of knowing that you had, um, that you had experienced that phenomenon. While in Portal, the designers of Portal know that if you complete the game, then you have definitely experienced the fling, because they put a bunch of puzzles in there that made it so that you couldn't progress until you did the fling. Okay, um, and so section three, here's where I've taken some project, I've done some projects that um, all, um, try to combine them, though this first one, I made it before Brett Victor's thing, before I saw Brett Victor's thing that um, is quite similar. So this is an interactive documentary, and some of you might know the game Asteroids, it was a very old game, um, kind of interesting because it, uh, I, I realised that you could use it to describe certain mathematical things, um, specifically in topology. Um, I won't go into detail here, but it worked really well. What happened was you would play around with this topological thing, and I added some extra mathematical stuff, and there was a narration that happened at the same time while you were playing the game. Um, and I got that idea from certain other games, uh, Dear Esther and Bastion, which are just they're very entertaining games. Um, with narration, and yeah, people found it enjoyable, and they were able to interact at the same time as hearing this narration, and they understood these topological ideas a little bit better than if I had just sat them down and explained it to them. Um, yeah. It was kind of successful. It wasn't ideal, though. Um, some people didn't quite get the yeah, get it. Um, this uh, second project was a little bit more like Brett Victor's thing. I took, I decided, um, I was quite impressed by his translation, so I decided to do a translation of my own. This was a paper on um, neuroscience. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to go into detail, but uh, this paper is very interesting. It's about um, the way that neurons in your head respond to um, respond to lines. When you look at a line, there are certain neurons that light up in your brain that we know about, and uh, yeah, there, there's some interesting mathematics there. And so, for example, there's a challenge. I'm going to give a basic example. Um, you, 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 you can see that my mouse is controlling this line, maybe. I'm controlling the rotation of this line, and I can get it to light, light up the left neuron, I can get it to light, light right one. I might want to, I can just about get it to the place where both of them are light, are light lit up. Um, so that challenge uh, clarifies in the player's head that there are specific orientations of that line um, that will... It, oh my goodness. I have no idea what just happened. Oh, bloody trackpads. Okay. Um, so much for that. Okay. Um, and by the way, uh, that environment there was worked on by a guy called Moira Bynon, who some of you might have heard of. Um, okay. Yeah, it attempted to use challenges to get across these mathematical ideas. They got a bit more sophisticated than that, just lighting up a neural thing. They used, it used challenges, um, it was intended to build up a complex idea, and it was an improvement on the paper, by which I mean that uh, there were people who were able to understand my explanation of the paper, who I very much doubt would have been able to understand the original paper. Right? Um, that's what we want to do, we want to make things more accessible. 
um, and some people found it fun. But I, my, my translation, it wasn't too well developed. Um, I would have needed a little bit more um, artistic stuff to express things to people. Um, yeah. But you know, it, these are all giving me ideas over you know new, for new projects. Um, this was just a video game that I made ages ago, which um, I was quite proud of. Uh, and it was it was just a video game. It developed my puzzle and level designs, my puzzle design skills, right? I, I, I ended up thinking a lot about these techniques and I used some of them and um, uh, I'd recommend that if you want to make an educational game, you should start by trying to make a normal game, right? Um, and there's also a part in it which teaches the Doppler effect because I found out that in this game, uh, um, okay, again, I can't go into details, but the mechanics of this game um, emergently gave rise to something like the Doppler effect, which some of you might have heard of, um, inside the game. And I set up some levels, set up some puzzles that um, so, so put it in the player's head. Um, okay, and here's the project that I'm now working on. Um, so there's a, this is about a virus structure. Um, viruses, as in not computer viruses, these are the things that give you um, you know, runny nose or give you HIV, blah blah. blah. Um, viruses are very interesting organisms, and there's a mathematical model that we have to describe their, the shapes of their bodies. Um, this model was discovered in 1962, and I read the paper. Um, it's quite a famous paper among virolo among people who study viruses, but um, uh, it's it's a really nice mathematical model. And I read it, and I was like, why is nobody visualize this before. So here's my visualization of the model. So you've got an icosahedron up there, and uh, this icosahedron sort of maps to that um, flat thing down there. Okay? Blue thing down there, you wrap it up and you get that icosahedron. And you can, uh, you can change this uh, sort of pattern downstairs um, that changes what is inside of the, the blue triangles. And by changing that, you get a different pattern up here. And you might recognize that as a geodesic dome. Um, yeah. Yeah. And don't worry, I'm just about to finish. So, okay, that's that. And uh, my intention with that project is to give it a narration because it worked well with the same bit with um, the Stranger Loop, which was the earlier game with the narration. Um, and I'll be using some puzzle design to make people play around with it in a certain way that allows them to notice certain things that can happen inside the engine. Um, so my, my closing thoughts are, uh, if you can, if, there, if it's possible to visualize or sort of automate a mathematical model, you should do it. If you notice that it can be done, you should do it and you should make a, um, if you can't be asked to spend too much time on the project, maybe you should just uh, you program it and then upload a video to YouTube. Or you know, maybe you want to be more of a game designer and um, use puzzle design to express things to people. And I really like, um, I think that this is a really promising um, avenue of human expression, really. Because, you know, I watch films, so like, if any of you have seen The Tree of Life, or Andre Tarkovsky films, or, yeah, whatever. Um, there are lots of films, lots of paintings, lots of music that try to express um, deep mathematics. Right? Uh, you go to a nice cathedral and it's like, wow, you're being impressed to some extent by the engineering possibilities um, or uh, the interesting mathematics in a piece by Bach or, um, yeah, you know, there are lots of examples or, yeah, you know, nice, nice astronomy stuff that's very impressive. Um, and so you could give people really sublime, really powerful experiences um, in a really natural, really fun way using video games. Uh, and that's what I'd like everybody to do. Um, if you're interested in these links, uh, there's a, this link here has um, the, has the articles that go into more detail on the games that I describe and the ways that they encourage you to do certain things. This is Brett Victor's website, um, and below is my Twitter handle. Um, I'm going to be uploading this slide to YouTube, but yes, okay, someone is taking a photograph of this slide. Um, please, I encourage, I mean, you know, you're all sitting here and you're listening to me talk, but what you should be doing is playing video games, these video games in particular. They're very interesting. 
They're really fun. They are not a chore to play. Um, they were made in order to entertain people. Um, and you know, some of these people would be really surprised that um, they're, they're being mentioned in an educational software lecture. Maybe some of them wouldn't be that surprised. But okay, you should play as many of these games as you can. Um, okay. And that is where I will end it. Thank you very much for coming.
there's pu the puzzles, uh, there are multiple ways of solving them. Almost all of the puzzles that's the case with. There are some exceptions that's actually quite interesting to investigate, but yeah, there's multiple ways of solving puzzles in general, um, and that leaves it with less specificity. And I wouldn't say that's a bad thing at all. I want diversity. However, specificity is something worth talking about as well. And in the case of um, this game, in the case of Catacomb Abyss, uh, they needed specificity. They needed it to be the case that the player would know that walls can be destroyed. And there are certain things that we need children to learn as well. And yeah. surgeons, right? There are certain things that I want a surgeon to know. And if I'm going uh, to have a surgeon be taught how to cut me up using a piece of educational software, then I can see an argument for letting that surgeon do it in whatever way they want. But there are certain things that I want to see specifically expressed to that surgeon as well. Okay. Um, didn't talk about Minecraft too much there, but yeah. Okay. Next question. So, <clears throat> texture presentation is one. I wanted to move back to sort of communicating the scientific yeah. publications. Yes. So I think it's an important endeavor. And I, I, I can imagine that sort of visualizing it or making it interactive it, it could be a very good way. And I suppose it touches upon the work that was done earlier, the practice in the C books that we had. Now, I was wondering, I can imagine it might work, but did you also think on sort of how to evaluate whether A, people actually learn more or more of it, and B, whether there are sort of certain aspects that they, that they grasp of it, or whether they actually got sort of the whole back? A very uh, difficult question. Um, so you're asking me, can we be scientific about scientific expression itself? Um, and you know, no. I I can't think of a way of being. Of, you know, I, I I want to be. If I want to say that something is scientific and that we can use statistics as a society to investigate it, I want to be quite um, strict on myself when I when I bestow that honour on a subject and. I can't think of a way of empirically evaluating whether these things work, but it seems just intuitive to me that, um, so looking at this again, this is called Casper Clue Theory, if it interests you, the shape of viruses, our model for the shape of viruses is called Casper Clue Theory, and it involves this cut-out thing and this wrap-up thing. Um, and when people usually want to explain Casper Clue theory to someone who's learning virology for the first time, they usually, you know, they do lots of little pictures, right? They're like, oh, here's one position that the, that the blue thing could be in, here's another, and you kind of have to stare at them for a while and get it into your head. But it just seems, it just seems obvious to me that this is better. I mean, I'm going, I play test, I'll say that. You know, I sit, I sit down, when I make a game or I make a piece of educational software, I sit someone down in front of it, get them to play it, and I watch them. And people have different responses. I, it's, a, again, not something that I could put in a great big table of numbers and say, oh, they got 8 out of 10 for comprehension, they, they got 7 out of 10 for blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't know how to do it, but... Sure. Somebody after learning to play this program, after sort of seeing a visualization, understood the topic of which you thought mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't have understood it just this yeah. way. Yeah. So, and I, I suppose, and I agree, the assessment is really difficult and we all you know, struggle, struggle with that. But even as a human person, you had some idea, some intuition of um, assessing whether that person understood it. Yeah, you're right. You know, I, I said that, I did say that, and I do believe that. Um, I can't show you, I can't show you it with. I can't show, prove to you that some numbers are above a certain threshold. I didn't do an MRI scan of it. I just think that that is the case. Okay, any more okay. questions? Questions? Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh. Right. How, how people use it. Okay. Oh, um, oh um, so. So you're asking, how, what am I going to develop this into? All right. So I'm going to make it into an interactive. My my hope. I'm looking for funding at the moment, actually. My hope is to make it into an interactive documentary. As in, um, I'd like to 
get someone to record a proper narration. I mean, with, this, with, the, with the earlier project, I recorded myself using a really bad microphone and so on, and I didn't edit it really well. I'd like to give this a, a full treatment where, um, like a David Attenborough documentary, you're looking at some stuff, you're, you're watching a virus replicate, for example, and you're hearing someone talk about virus replication and some things that might interest you about virus replication. And then you start playing around with this thing and you see that, oh, some viruses might replicate in this way because they're this shape, but if I change it like this, then some viruses might be replicated. You might realize some viruses will replicate in that way because they're this shape. Stuff like that. Um, and uh, I'm confronting some difficult questions at the moment because what I've got here is a sort of raw game engine. Um, you, you start this up on your computer and some of my friends have played around with this and they're like, oh, this is kind of, this feels good to play with. Um, but I can't, th but I've got to um, work out some objects to put into the game, the game. Um, I've got to work out some objects that I can put in it that will allow me to assemble um, particular challenges that people have to do. And, the kind of objects that I should put into it is a difficult question. Okay. Okay. Any last question? This might be more of a comment, but I just can't help noticing how you seem to enjoy doing these things so much, and I believe you learned a lot about things that might not be in your background. Okay. So I was just thinking that you know, maybe it's worth looking at how to replicate this experience with learners so, so that they won't just be users of your game but engage them in creating something and going through the same learning process that you've gone through in creating the games so it's more like learning to create a game but also creating a game to learn well yeah um i i wouldn't know how to turn someone into me i wouldn't know how to do that um, i can only give them little bits of me in their heads, um, but I'm fine with that. It seems to me that um, it seems to me that um, you know, I would, it would certainly be wonderful if we could turn everybody into um, if we not if we could turn everybody into me. That would be very nice. Um, but if yes, if everyone can work on projects like this. But uh, the thing that concerns me is just people don't have so much as much understanding of science as they would need, right? We're entering a period of like horrendous ecological responsibility, and um, we need people to modify their um, idea of what is moral to encompass things that scientists tell them, basically, such as if you if you fly in a plane, then you're probably doing something pretty bad to the environment. Um, yeah, we need people to be more a bit more scientific, be a bit more aware of this stuff. Yeah. Yes. Creatures like us 
to understand four-dimensional worlds. The best way of understanding what you're looking at here with everything sort of morphing is to say, imagine a two-dimensional creature, a fish, that, can, that only has a concept of, I'm going to pause that briefly, that only has a concept of forward and backward and up and down. You've got a fish on this plane. It can't see anything over here. It can't see anything over here. This fish can explore this little slice of the room, but it can't see the rest. We're going to give this fish the ability to turn itself 90 degrees and now explore this part of the room. Okay? And this fish might be like, oh my god, this is very strange. Um, I'm having to see all these new shapes. Um, but that's exactly what's happening in Migakura. When you, when you see that morphing, what's happened is the player has pressed a button that rotates them 90 degrees into a dimension that they, in, I don't want to say into a dimension, but it replaces um, one of the dimensions that they can see with a dimension that they can't see. This is a very worthwhile game, and I genuinely think this is literally just about to change the world. It's going to come out in about, well, it might be another year, but the guy has been working on it for ages. For those of you who are interested in four who already know something about four-dimensional geometry, by the way, that shape there is a um, 120 cell, if that interests you, and I think I'm probably being told to shut up now. Okay. So thank you again. This session is over. We will see you again after the coffee break. The next session about workshop will start at half past four. So thank you.